to, to the book of Jeremiah 29 and 11. Jeremiah 29 and 11. We're going to start a two-part series today. I say two-part series. The last time I started something like this, it ended up going much, much longer than we expected. But I'm going to, we're going to start out with a text that all of you are very, very familiar with. And we're going to get into some things today that I think are, are, are going to take us to a whole new place. And we're going to, this series is called The Gap. The problem with Christians and the problem with churches and the problem with most people, pastors, everybody, we're really good at telling you where you should be. Uh, you're really good at knowing God's called you or spoken to you or you have dreams and visions and desires. But, but there is a gap between where you are and how to get there. And the problem is, is when you have a gap there, very few people can help you fill that gap without the leadership of the Holy Spirit because it's unique to you. And most people want to start saying, this is exactly how it should be. But this is what you've got to understand. God said this in, in Jeremiah 29 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, verse 12 is, is really important, and nobody ever reads this. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Verse 13, And you will seek me. And find me when you search for me in your heart. Now, stop right there. Cameron, put up verse 11 in the, uh, <clears throat> give, put it in the, in the uh, message translation first, please. In the message translation, it says it this way. I lo and I love the message. It says, I know what I'm doing. I've planned it all out. Plans to take care of you. Not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. Stop right there. Most people in this room, if I pressured you, and I don't mean pressure in a bad way, but if, if I really just said, tell me what your dream is, most people don't even, <clears throat> most people can't even articulate their dream because they've been so beat down by this world or even by ministry or even their own thoughts to think that they're not allowed to dream anymore. But yet, even in the Old Testament, before we even walked into a new covenant, God says, hey, I know what I'm doing. I got it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon. And the reason I like the message is because I know what I'm doing. I've got it all planned out. The problem with the King James, and, and people always get mad at me when I say that, but the problem with the King James is the translation, the translators translated things from a, a different mindset, and they used wrong the wording in the King James that says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. Well, let me explain something to you. God is a spirit. He's not human like us. His thoughts become his words. His words become your reality. So if he thinks those plans towards you, they come out of him at some point. And if God has things come out of him as words, they have to happen. The only person, now listen to me, good Christian, wonderful people. The only people that can stop an almighty God is you. And your words, and your way of doing things, and your tradition, and your thought process. And, and the truth is, God's thoughts towards you are this. Hey, I know what I'm doing, y'all. Just get close to me. Pull yourselves close. Listen to what I'm saying to you. And when you listen to me and I tell you what to do, quit, quit referring to flesh. The one thing that, that people need to learn to do, and this will help all of you, is if you know it in here, quit listening to people out there. Listen, I love you all. People don't care about your dreams. Your family don't care about your dreams. They, they, they care about you, but they have dreams for you. Now, my family was here, uh, you know, and y'all got me. But and my family, and I love my family, if they were here, I'd say the exact same things. They look at me, and, and, and they know I'm this, this, this out there personality, so they're going to do everything possible to reel me in to keep me from getting hurt. But they don't realize, but if I'm doing what God told me to do, then he knows the plans that he has for me. Then if he's okay with it, I'm okay with it. And see, it's when people, now listen, when people have a human love, they can't help you bridge a gap that spiritual love can only bridge. There are things that you have to walk into. There's a bridge in the spirit that has to be built through your prayers. Show, show me verse 12 in the message, please. Now check this out. When you call on me, 
when you come and pray to me, I'll listen. Two words, most important words you're going to hear today. I'll listen. How many times have you gone into prayer? Don't raise your hands, but, but you feel like there's nothing. Nobody's listening. God, are you even hearing me? Do you even care? Is there anything I'm saying that you're paying attention to? Is there anything going on in my life that you're aware of? And the truth is, this is where you have to understand what the Word's saying. When you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I'll listen. Verse 13. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious, here it is, when you get serious about finding me. Not, most people think an hour and a half of telling God how awful it is is prayer. Y'all, that ain't praying. That's complaining in Jesus' name. That's what that is. He ain't listening to that. I don't mean to bust your bubble, and, and I don't know what you were taught in children's church with juice and cookies. That ain't true. When you get serious, when, see, the, the time in my life when I sat down and I turned off everything, I told you all about it Wednesday night, when I turned off everything, I, it amazes me how attached to technology we are. When I turned off everything, I turned off my iPad, I turned off my laptop, turned off my phone, locked myself in this room, and it took me days to unplug. It took me days to get, but then when it, something switched, all of a sudden there was this place I had gotten serious with him. I wasn't just seeking him for another word to preach. I wasn't just seeking for another opportunity to go minister to somebody. I wasn't seeking for my own kingdom. I wasn't trying to grow a church. I was trying to grow me. And when you get serious about God, you quit worrying about your ministry and you get to get really focused on what he's saying because what he's saying is ministry on all levels. It, it heals your heart. It heals your mind. It heals your body. It heals your relationships. It bridges a gap that will never be bridged without serious time. If you can't give God the same amount of time you give Facebook, you ain't serious. Oh, Lord, it got, oh, I felt that one. Now, listen, I understand because I'm, I, I'm from the camp of the Word of Faith. You cut me, I bleed faith. I understand that we have gotten to where we teach faith so strong that sometimes it's hard to get it. I get that. But it doesn't change the truth. The truth is that he wants you to seek him first, to get serious about it, to put yourself in a position to where you hear his voice and his voice alone. We, when, when I was growing up, inevitably this happened with everybody that I knew. Even now with my daughters and my sons, I can see it. When, when you begin to build a relationship with somebody... Whether it's just a friendship, uh, uh, you know, of, of a peer in school or, or a relationship with a boyfriend or girlfriend. And, and as things begin to progress, two things happen. That person begins to become like you or you begin to become like that person. And, 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 and I've seen countless times parents getting on their kids you know, you're acting just like him or you're acting just like her and this is not you. And, and, and the truth is, is there was, a, <clears throat> there was a, a deficit in their identity somewhere. And as they begin to grow into something, that is being filled with something that's not God. And the, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily, you know, that they're horrible people. It's just that their behavior patterns change when they begin to be get, get filled with something that is out of the norm. Well, God is trying to get you to get serious and bridge a gap and go to a place where he can change something on the inside and fill you up with something you ain't been filled up with yet. And what we got to get is that to get there, we need to know what the Word says. Now, go to Romans chapter 1 for me. Romans chapter 1. I know that we teach faith strong, and we should. But we also have to be more focused on where people are. Romans 1, we're going to start at 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, the Jew first, also to the Greek. <clears throat> for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, the message says it this way. I love the way the message says it. It's news I'm most proud of to proclaim, the, mess the extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts Him, starting with the Jews, then right on to everyone else. God 
God's way of putting people right shows up in acts of faith, confirming what Scripture says all along. The person in right standing before God, listen now, before God by trusting Him really lives. Now, and then it goes on to say this. Go to, go to 18. But God's angry displeasure erupts and acts as human mistrust and wrong. See, and I, the way that the, the message says this is very simple. The minute that you pull yourself away from God's leading in your life, even though you call yourself spiritual or Christian or church going, there's a whole lot of people sitting in pews today that their lives not lining up to what he said. The minute you pull yourself away from what he's trying to pull you into, your life begins to spiral. And the minute the spiral begins, you have a choice. You have a choice to realize that there's now a gap. And when there's a gap between you and God, He didn't put it there. Oh, y'all hearing me? If there's a gap between you and God, He didn't put it there. All He wants is to hold you close. All He wants is to, to have you on His lap speaking to you. There is a reason that John was called the favorite disciple because he always laid on Jesus' chest. He could always hear the heartbeat of His Savior. He could always hear what was going on inside. And that's where God wants you. When, when our children were growing up, Hannah and Aaron both were the same way, and, and Jordan's still this way now, but they, they always wanted to be sitting on my lap. They always wanted to be close to me. They always wanted until they got a little older. And then they, you know, they're too cool for me now. But see, Jordan's figured out something that Hannah and Aaron never figured out. See, Hannah and Aaron were like, they hit a certain age about where Jordan's at now, and they would say, they would say, oh, you, you always want, you always want hugs and kisses and all, yeah, just go on. Not, not realizing that, that the very person they're pushing away is the person that's buying everything they want. Jordan's figured it out because Jordan's as tall as April. And she'll climb up, I mean, I can't even, I mean, she'll, she'll let me tell you about Jordan. Jordan knows so clearly that if she gets something, it comes through me. To the point she will say, Mom, my stomach hurts a little bit. Will you stay down here with me? So April will stay in the den and watch TV with her. And then April will inevitably doze off and fall asleep right there on the couch. 20 minutes later, I'll hear feet coming up the stairs. Jordan will climb in the bed with me with this big grin on her face. And she'll bring her pillow and her cover and she'll lay down and she'll go, I got her to sleep. <laughs> That's, that, that happens all the time. Because she knows... <laughs> This guy's got the wallet. So, now, what does that mean? It's real simple. That's how God wants you to be for Him. He wants you to be willing to put anything and everything to sleep just to be able to spend time with Him. Even if it's just a few minutes, even if it's just a moment, even if it's just an opportunity to, to, to settle into His presence and just hear what He's saying for the day. Do you realize that He wants you to seek Him first, not so you have to get up and spend 24 hours in prayer? but so that He gives you exactly what you need so you can command your day so that you don't have to deal with the foolishness that you, that you normally have to deal with? Do you realize that you have that power, you have that authority, you have it in Christ, but the problem isn't that, that you don't know how to access it. The problem is that there's a gap between you and being in Christ. doesn't mean you're not saved. Oh, listen, there's a big difference between being saved and being in Christ. Because when you're in Christ... <laughs> Well, here we go again. We're going back to this. And I don't have time to go to the Scriptures. It's in Galatians. But when you go, when you're in Christ, because the Bible says you have not learned Christ, He was talking to save people. Come on now. Now, they know Jesus, but they're not in Christ. How is that possible? It's because they believe in a Savior, but they haven't stepped into what, did that, save, what that Savior has left for them. You have not learned Christ, is what the Word says. You can be Christians. You can be so focused on everything church-wise, but not hearing what He's saying and flowing in the Christ anointing and just be saved by Jesus' blood. Is this making sense to you? To bridge the gap is very simple. You have to understand that the Word works. You do the believing. The Word does the work. Isaiah 55 and 11 says, so shall my word that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish uh, that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing I sent it. The message says it this way. It'll do the work. It'll do exactly what I sent it to do. What, uh, they'll complete the assignment that I gave him. 
Verse 12 in the message says, So you'll go out in joy. You'll be led into a whole and complete life. The whole point... Now, I told you earlier, if you, keep, if you cut me, I, blur, I bleed faith. Word of faithers, for the longest time, we were so word conscious about what came out of your, oh, don't say that, Job's worst fears came upon him. And I, we say that kind of stuff, not understanding that our confession was supposed to be the confession that we had gotten from him in close quarters with him. Hearing intimately what he's saying to us. Not just religiously reciting what's on Creflo's website. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one. We got caught up in that so much that it became... I mean, I saw people slap Cadillacs and say, It's mine. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the guy that sat on the third row. I mean, it, it just amazed me how people would get caught up in that stuff. And I got caught up in it too. But the truth is, prosperity is this. You'll go out in joy. You'll be led into a whole and complete life. Don't you want that for your family? Don't you want that for your kids? Don't you want that for you? Don't you want that for every relationship that you're in? For everything to be whole and complete. Now, to do that, you've got to understand some things. And, and there are going to be some hard truths to learn, but, but here's some truths you've got to learn. That there should be no void in your words because there's no void in your faith. Most people are really good at confessing what they hear us as leaders say, but they don't have the faith to walk in it themselves. I, 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 I hear it all the time, Pastor Allen, if we just had your faith, if we just believe like you, this didn't happen overnight. This is a developed thing. And, and people are foolish if they think there's not times that I sit back and go, God, well, I have no idea how we're going to get where we're going. It's normal. It's normal to have a gap. What's not normal is to let that gap become a crevice. And to let that crevice become such a, you're, then you become an island. See, God's not the one moving. He's always there. He wants you close to Him. He wants you a part of what's going on. He wants you to understand this. Now listen to me. Everybody in this room is called to do something great. Whether you believe it or not, everybody in this room is called to do something great. Your greatness and somebody else's greatness aren't worthy to be compared because everybody's task in the body is so important that it's so silly to think, I'm this and you're that. Well, I want to be that. And Listen, that, that, that's just crazy. What you've been called to do, and if you hadn't figured it out yet, we're, we're developing a system right now that we're going to be helping you here in the, in the very short coming days and weeks. But here's what I want you to get. Your calling, because you all got one, isn't subject to anything but your own mouth. You will walk in it as you begin to understand what you're called into. You're, it's subject to your words. Now listen to me. And this is hard truth for people to understand because I can't tell you how many people sit in that office with me and I hear this thing. Well, I tried to do this, but this one wouldn't let me. I tried to do that, and this and that, and this and this, and my wife, and my, my husband, and my kids, and, and this pastor, and that pastor. Your calling can only be stopped by your character, not other people. Y'all listen to me now. What you're called to do, trust me, when you look at me standing up here, and I, I know it's, it's not impressive, I don't preach good, I fumble around, but I love people. And the truth is, I'm only here because I decided my calling is what he said, not what you said, and I'm going to stay on it. The truth is, I know people sitting at home today that are much more talented, much more qualified. they got, they got many more things on the wall than I've got. They can preach circles around me. They can play. They can sing. They know how to do all these wonderful things. But in here is broken. And when you're broken in here, you break out there. And, and I had some folks in my office this morning and, and, and apologized for some things that I had said. And, and the truth is, the reason I do that, it's not because I don't make mistakes. It's because I refuse to be broken again. I will stay whole and release whole. That's what I do. That's what I have to do. Because I understand where I'm going is in my mouth. It's not in yours. Now, your character is revealed in your words. Who you are will show up. It amazes me the amount of people that every time I sit down with them, it's always, <laughs> you know, you know. There are certain ministry conversations you have behind the scenes that that things have to be dealt with, and 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 hurts and wounds and pasts, and those are normal. 
But it amazes me just in the setting of bumping into somebody in Walmart, the amount of people that immediately have something to say about the leadership they're under. We were at uh, Cracker Barrel. Just my birthday, actually. is when you got... No, it's past, you guys gave us past appreciation. They gave us a card for Cracker Barrel, and we were all at Cracker Barrel. And we were sitting there, and now you got to understand, for us to sit in Cracker Barrel goes from here to the sound booth. We were all there. And now I'm sitting on this end, and I'm, I'm playing with Jordan and Zion, and we're taking pictures, and, and uh, you know, and Seth and Gabriel, and I think Cameron, you were on the end. They were, everybody was on that end, and I didn't know this was going on. There was another table of a lot of people, probably 10, 15 people. And, and Cameron's a witness. He can tell me that if I tell it wrong, you speak up. And I'm not going to go into great detail. Undoubtedly, it was a Pentecostal church. Uh, and they, were, they, they hadn't even got their appetizers good for they were having lunch on their leader and his wife. She needs to get up off our fat, lazy butt and do something. Now, these are, these are the man and woman of God that they're talking about. Now, I don't know the church. April's thankful that the tables weren't flipped around because I'd have just had to move my chair over and sit with them and listen for because I will. She knows I will. That's why she don't let me go out much. But the thing is, oh, I will. I will. It happened at Brusco's one night, and I was like, hey, what, what church y'all go to? So I know never, ever to go there. She's like, let's go. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. <laughs> Please hear me, people, because everybody in this room, whether you know it or not, we're going into a place where we're fixing to build some momentum in this church. When they come into this door, they're going to see you. And if they see a broken, lazy, mouthy you, that's what they're going to think this church is. Amen. So we've got to line up to what he's trying to do to build the momentum. Momentum's a funny thing. Momentum is great when you've got it. You ever going down a hill, take your foot off your pedals on your bike and just ride? You feel like you're just going to take off flying. But, but when you're learning to ride that bike, it's, it's, it feels like it's never going to happen. But once you get the momentum built, it's hard to stop. If you build your momentum in the wrong way, it's hard to stop that. So when you do things, you have to do them as unto Christ. You have to. Because if you do them as unto Christ, you can't get mad at people when things don't go your way. It, it amazes me. So we're sitting there and we're hearing. I, I didn't hear about this till we were leaving, but they were listening. And I'm talking about Gabriel Bailey was mad. I thought Gabriel was about to stab somebody with a fork. <laughs> Let me tell you why. They've heard people say that very same thing to us. So, now listen. When I step up to this pulpit and I fail and I mess up and I say things I shouldn't. But I have to step up here with the mindset of the single mother who can't pay their bills. I have to step up here with the mindset of, of the heroin addict that's in jail. I have to step up here with the mindset of the, ca the cancer victim that's fighting for their healing. I have to step up here with the mindset of somebody who's so broken inside they can't have a real relationship because they don't know how to treat people. I have to step up here thinking about the person who is the, the, the lowest but wants to be the highest and realize that sheep grow but goats climb. There's a difference. People have to understand the way that I think when I walk up here has to be different than I wish you'd get off your lazy butt and do something. But that's what they want to say about their ministers but they don't realize that they may be the very person to call to help to change everything. But rather than, see, because your words will show your calling or your character or both, they sh an entire family. Now, we're talking about men my age down to little children, teaching these little children to call a woman of God fat and lazy. And they don't understand the curse People don't like to talk about curses no more, but let me, you might want to read your Bible. Because when you speak against the anointing. So here's the thing. When they begin to tell me that, I, gra I told Gabriel, we, we sat down and talked about it, and I said, look, you know, Cameron and the rest of them were old enough to handle it, but the little guys, I said, look, you, you got to understand, people are people, and this is why they need Jesus. They've been introduced to salvation, but they've never been introduced to Jesus. Because Jesus don't talk to people like that. Amen. Now, here's the thing. Matthew 12 and 33 says this. Either make the, uh, make the tree good, of his good and his good fruit, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. And Jesus, now this is Jesus talking. 
O generation of vipers, how you being evil speak good things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Then it goes on to talk about the treasures and all of this. Now verse 37. I'm sorry, verse 36 is really important. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Your future isn't in the hands of others. It's in your mouth. It is. Now, we're building a foundation here because you've got to understand some things. There's a lot of things that we deal with. There's a lot of things that we say. There's, there's laws of confession and laws of this and laws. A law is just simply a predictable outcome. That's all it is. If somebody is so negative that they would talk about their pastors. And, and I, listen, y'all are good people. Y'all don't talk about it. I'm not, I'm not trying to say somebody's talked about us. I don't use God's time to straighten nobody out. I've, I've proven that over, over 13 years. But when you live your life coming against people over you, whether it's your pastor, your pastor's wife, or your boss, the people you work with, when you spend your life and it's everybody else's fault, you might want to look in the mirror. Because the truth is, is you're growing what you're saying. People get mad at me because they say, well, you know, the word of faith's dying out and, and, and you know, it's old. And, and the truth is, some of the things we taught were, were off base. They were more, more religious than anything. But nothing changes about seed time and harvest. And the greatest seeds that you have are not your money, it's your mouth. Amen. You sow into your family who you are. The greatest example of who a man is is looking at his family. The greatest example of looking at who a couple is is looking at their family. The greatest example of a church isn't looking at me. Will y'all please listen to me? The greatest example and the greatest ministry of this church will never be me. It'll always be you. It will always be you because people will always see you. When people come in and we got 150 people packed into here, they won't be doing life just with me. They'll be doing life with all of you. And they have to know that you don't just put on your church face on Sunday at 11.15 because, you know, the song's not over till 11.15 and now I've got to be holy. Here's, what it hap here's how it works. When you settle in to understanding who and what you are, you understand that your, your mindset and the way you think, your relationship with God and the gap that you're trying to fill is only filled with what we said in the beginning, getting serious with Him. There's a lot of people that will get serious with church. You'll get serious with church, and you'll want to, you'll, you'll, you know, uh, trust me, I, I, I've told several people this in the past. I don't need church worshipers. I need kingdom builders. There's two different things. Church worshipers are here every time you open the door, and they want to help, and they want to clean, and they want, and I wish we had a few. <laughs> but they want to do this, and they want to do that. Give me something to do, give me something to do, give me something to do, give me something to do until they're tired. And then when they're tired, Pastor, why are you putting all this on me? I'm one person. And the truth is, that's somebody who's trying to do everything, not the one thing. See, all of you are called to do the one thing. When you bridge that gap between you and God, you begin to understand what that one thing is. And when you settle into it, you begin to know. Now, here's, here's something I want to say to you. Faith and trust with God only begins with authentic relationships. Authentic relationships are honest. They're real, down and dirty. They're, 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 they're focused solely on, on trying to get things better. They're genuine. Because here's the thing. Do you realize that it's possible, now go with me, it's possible to believe in something and never be equipped to walk in it? Do you understand that that is a very real problem in the church? Is that we believe in healing. We believe in the anointing. We believe in financial prosperity. We believe in the greatness of, of what God's trying to do. We believe in all of these wonderful things, but yet we're not equipped to walk in them because we haven't bridged the gap. It's not that the Word's not being preached. You can find the Word on any channel. You can find a, you can find a church on every corner. They may not be teaching exactly what you want to hear, but they're teaching something. The problem is not, is it being taught? The problem is, are you bridging a gap? Because you've got the knowledge. But let me explain something to you. Knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom 
is the application and experience of the knowledge. A lot of people got a lot of knowledge, but you're not walking in the wisdom of it because you don't think it works for you. And you don't think it works for you because you're not close to Him. And you're not close to Him because you don't have an authentic relationship. And you don't have an authentic relationship because you've been hurt. And you won't trust Him because you can't trust them. And He ain't them. My greatest asset, and my wife will tell you this, everybody that's ever known me will tell you this. My greatest asset when I first got saved, y'all know the story, I was a drug addict and God supernaturally delivered me just like that. It was not that I had the deliverance. That wasn't the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It wasn't that I was a drug addict, then I wasn't. It wasn't that I was... Uh, you know, this horrible person and I wasn't. It wasn't that, uh, 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 you know, I was a musician and I laid all that down for Jesus. That sounds holy. No, no, no. It was my greatest asset was this, that I had a good daddy. He died when I was 12, but I trusted him. And my greatest asset, my wife will tell you, because I had a good daddy, it was so easy to fall in love with God. And I trusted Y'all, I trust things that y'all think. I don't even tell people half the things God's told me because it's just out there. But he said it. That's enough. I don't talk to people. I don't confer with flesh. I don't. Uh, in meetings, I, people tell me what they, they want me to know, and, and that's wonderful. But, but I try to be real closed off and do exactly what he says because the truth is it's what he says that causes growth in me. And if there's growth in me, then I can release growth to you. It's not just coming up here with another series, another graphic. Those things are wonderful. It's not just coming up here and saying, oh, we got the video production going now. The, the, Steve's taking over the drum set, thank God, so I can now focus. No, 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 no. My focus is on making sure that the gap is as small as it can be. So that even if I'm far enough away that his voice is an echo, that's too far. You understand Feelings are the voice of the flesh. You do understand that, right? Your feelings are the voice of your flesh. I can't live by my feelings. Because when I live by my feelings, I become this person that I don't want to be. I make decisions based on those feelings that aren't focused on what he said. Reasoning, listen, reasoning is the voice of your soul. That's your mind, your will, and, your, and those are human. And the worst thing that you can do is reason out something that God's told you to do. Because it makes no sense for Jonah to be in the belly of a whale. It makes no sense for a Savior to lay himself down when he felt like there was... See, Jesus tried to reason by saying, if there be any other way. But he followed it up with what? Nevertheless, what you said. See, it's okay, it's okay to question, it's okay to wonder, you know, it's okay to say, God wants you to come to Him. He wants you to. But it's not okay to be so caught up in your own emotion and your own reasoning that you never understand wisdom, which is your spirit. See, we don't understand the depth of who we really are. There's two types of belief and I'm going to try to wrap up right here. There are two types of belief on this planet. There's a biblical belief and there's a worldly belief. And all of you would like to say that you have a biblical belief. But if I show you in this word where the Bible is very clear, let's take something that's very touchy with everybody is money. If I show you in here where God wants to pour out on you according to, how, uh, according to how the abundance that you give, the abundance he wants to pour out on you. If I showed that to you versus Sons supermarket has milk for three dollars. You're gonna believe milk before you're gonna believe the word. Where we have to train ourselves that if somebody walks up to me and said, God's gonna do this, this, and this, that my first reaction is, if you believe it because he said it, that's enough. Not well, son. Let's t see, let me explain something to you. I'm just gonna tell you an experience from my life. I was under a minister as an armor bearer, and the Lord spoke to me to give him a car. I had a 1972 hatchback Nova. Son. 
350 four barrel holly carburetor, her shifter. It was fast, but it wouldn't go out of Jasper. It broke down every time I crossed the bridge. That's the truth. Cameron and my line, that is the truth. Every time I tried to take it somewhere, it'd break down. But now around Jasper, it, so it was hot. But anyway, it was red. It was red with white pinstripes. Bucket seats with crushed velvet back and seat with leather, white leather fronts. Oh, I still remember. And I remember the day God said, give it away. And I cried. I was upset, wasn't I? I was not happy. But he said, tell me who to give it to. I called them. They were a minister in my life. I said, I'm believing God for a truck. I want to get my business back in Birmingham. I need to be where I can work in Birmingham. This car is not going to haul my tools. I'm believing God for a truck. Well, why don't you just sell it and buy a truck? That's not what God said, dude. Uh, and this was a mentor. This was my pastor. This is who I was serving. And, and I finally, I mean, he kept reasoning. Now, listen, he kept reasoning. And you remember the conversation. I said, look, you want it or not? Because now I don't, you're going to argue with me. I keep it. But this is what God said. And finally, I just said, I'm bringing it to your house. I'm bringing it. That was on a Thursday. He said, no, 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 no. So Friday, on, on, on the way to work, I was praying. I said, God, I'm trying to sow this seed. I know you said give, and I began to describe the car to God, just in case he missed it. He might have been talking about the old hoopty, but he was talking about that one. God said, just do what I told you to do. By the time I got, and that was the Thursday, the Thursday, he wouldn't accept it. The Friday, I was complaining to God about it. By 10 o'clock Friday night, I was in Gadsden with a truck. Somebody called, do you remember? Somebody called, they had a car rental place, and they said, look, man, I don't know what's going on. Just get down here. I thought there was a problem. We flew down to Gadsden. It was a good friend of ours. Uh, we flew down to Gadsden because I thought there was a problem because there was a person in their family with some health issues. Flew down there and got to his place, and he wasn't there, and I'm like, what? What's going on? And there was a sign on the door that said, go to the gas station. And I walked into the gas station. That lady goes, you Alan? I said, yes, ma'am. And she handed me an envelope. And in the envelope was a title and a set of keys for a truck. So I got back on the phone. And I said, are you going to take this car or not? And they reluctantly took it. The sad thing in that is not... Did I walk out blessed? Because I did. I was going to see I obeyed. The sad thing is, is the mentor over me had no clue that I could hear God. The mentor over me missed what God was trying to do for him by reasoning. Now, the whole point is not about cars and giving. And the whole point is this. I was adamant. That if I had to drive that car in his yard at 2 o'clock in the morning and tape the keys to his front door, he was going to get that car. And he could sell it and do what he wanted to with it. But I had to obey. See, people ask me all the time, you, you're not even a good preacher. You know, you didn't come from a good background. Your start in ministry was ridiculous. You were an armor bearer. You were this. You were that. How are you where you are? How are you got all this staying power? Everybody shut down except for you. You're still going, I don't know. Other than the fact that I'm just too dumb to quit. I know what he said. I don't need big salaries. I love learning to fly, but I don't need that. All I need to know is lay my head down at night and know that I heard him. And, and if, I can, if I can just get that heartbeat in you, and I believe most of you have it, but if I can get that to you, you won't be like me and have these flashes of the flesh where you snatch somebody through a Taco Bell window just because they're not listening. That's not what you need to be, trust me. It's very bad. But here's what it comes down to. The only way, listen to me now, the only way to bridge the gap is to trust. And I'm a faith guy, but trust ain't faith. Those are two very different things. Faith, faith, faith is very impersonal. Faith is, this is what the Word says, I'm believing. Trust. There's relationship in that. 
See, I trust people that I have relationship with. I trust people that are willing to take the time to get to know me. I trust people who are willing to get outside of their box and get into mine a little bit because mine's not really a box. It's more like an octagon. But we still have fun inside of there. I'm telling you, I need you to understand that God wants you to leave your past in the past because your past has nothing to do with your future and your future has everything to do with your trust. And if you can just trust Him, you can accept that He made you everything that he made Jesus that he wants you to be everything Jesus was if you can just accept that quit questioning yourself quit reasoning yourself out quit making excuses quit wondering why and just accept that he did because you're not here by accident you're not you're not on this planet you're not breathing you're not in this church you are not here to sit on a new chair that's cushy you're here to become the very thing God called you to be. And as a pastor, I've made a vow to, to myself, I made a vow to God that over the next few months and even into 2016, that this church is going to do everything possible to empower you to become what you were called to be, even if you don't know what it is yet. My, my, my sole focus is to change the culture. If we could change the culture in this church, everything's driven by culture, whether you believe it or not. There's, there's Baptist cultures, there's Church of Christ cultures, there's Pentecostal cultures, there's Word of Faith cultures. The truth is, we've got to change the normal. The normal's got to become the fact that we're, train, we're training you to be in a culture of trust. Not trust for everybody around you, but trust for Him. Because the truth is, if he, just see, I love my pastor. I still love him. I knew that there were some things that I had learned he disagreed with. But I also knew he spoke to me. And if he spoke to me to do something, bless God, I was going to do it. And I'd answer, I'd, I'd deal with the consequences later. Now, I wasn't usurping the authority of the church or anything like that. I understand that. We ain't talking about, well, Pastor, God spoke to me to paint polka dots on the sanctuary wall. When can I get in? No, no, we ain't talking about that. We're talking about doing what he told me to do outside the realm of leadership. And, and the truth is, when it comes down to it, my heartbeat is for each and every one of you to look at me not as an example of somebody that's great, but an example of somebody that through all the hell I've been through and I've been through it, it's trust that brought me through. Not because I'm special or I'm more anointed, because I'm not. Not because the gifts I flow in, because I don't beat my chest and talk about those. But it's because I refuse for that gap between me and God to get any bigger than it is right now. I want to know. See, when we get in the truck, all, I, all my little guys will ride with me or something. They'll make Jordan ride right next to me in my in the cab of my truck, and they call it riding girlfriend. They're like, you can ride girlfriend. So if it's just like me and Caleb and Gabriel, I'll make Caleb or Gabriel. I'm like, come on, you riding girlfriend. Why do they call it girlfriend? Because there ain't no gap between us. That's how I want me and God to be. I want to know that if I throw my arm around him, his is already back at mine. You realize that's, hey, that's what he wants for you. You realize he wants so much to just hold you close. That's all he wants. He's not trying to get your money from you. He's not trying to get your time from you. He's not trying to change you in any other way than for you to be the best you you were created to be from the time you were born. He knew who you were before your parents knew who you were. And his job is to get you to forget your past. And just like the word said in, in the message translation, to have a whole life for your whole life. Amen. Isn't that good?